Next, a conversation with another Earth Summit attendee, a non-official one from the developing world. Charlene Hunter Galt reports. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wangari Maathai. 52-year-old Wangari Maathai is one of Africa's most unusual and outspoken women, a professor of veterinary medicine educated in both the U.S. and her native Kenya. She spent 10 years in the lab doing research on animals, parasites, and parasitic diseases so prevalent in her country. But in 1977, she left the lab and launched a program that has transformed more than the Kenyan landscape. It was 14 years after independence and Kenya's effort to modernize and meet the needs of its growing population had virtually laid waste to Kenya's forests, eroding the soil, dwindling fuel supplies, and diminishing the country's historic beauty. Wangari Muthai's project involved planting trees in open spaces, on school grounds, and along roads, setting up green belts that would not only restore the ecological balance, but would also provide income for the women who planted. For every tree that survived three months outside the nursery, the women earned 50 cents. Within 10 years, what had become known as the Green Belt Movement had created 600 tree nurseries, grown 10 million trees, and involved 50,000 women and children. The effort didn't go unnoticed. This is a great moment for me and for all the wonderful women, especially who plant trees in Kenya. In 1977, when we planted seven trees, many people thought that we were just joking because we were just a bunch of women. But many years later, we are talking about millions of trees, and some people have started taking women seriously after all. But not all of the notice was favorable. In a one-party state, which dealt harshly with opposing voices, Muthai took the ruling party to court and not only blocked construction of a 62-story office building on the site of Nairobi's Uhuru Park, but frightened away foreign investors and killed the project. The government accused Muthai of having insects in her head. Muthai's activism has increased in the face of brutal treatment and murder of government opponents and as the international community has pressed Kenyan President Daniel Arap Moy to release his iron grip on power and legalize multi-party politics, a move he announced last December. After raising questions about reports that the president was planning a scheme to renege on his promise, Muthai was charged with rumor-mongering and must stand trial when she returns from the Rio summit. I spoke with her during a stopover in New York. How did a program that started out planting trees end up being labeled as subversive by the government? Well, I think that in the light of what is happening in Africa today, it is possible to see why an environmental movement that was trying to raise awareness of the people on how the environment is destroyed by even governments which are non-accountable. In the light of what is happening, we can say it's because we are dealing with a dictatorial government, a government that did not want to be responsible to its people. That's the kind of development that we do not want. And raising the awareness of the people to that level is easy to be seen as subversive. But it's clearly moved beyond an environmental movement. For example, you uh, were rendered unconscious by gas thrown by the police while you and uh, some of the women were on a hunger strike. That was a political rally. Well, what we were doing is supporting mothers of political prisoners. At this time, in the process of democratization of our country, we still have a lot of political prisoners in jail. And we feel that these prisoners are prisoners of conscience, men who spoke against the dictatorial regime that we have had in Kenya at a time when it was very dangerous to do so. It's no different from what we have been campaigning for in South Africa. And so we feel that you really cannot keep those men in jail without being grossly unjust. So we joined the mothers 
of these men in uh, appealing to the Kenyan government to release them. And instead of listening to the mothers, the government sent us police, armed police, to come and disrupt the meeting and to beat us. I know that uh, those of us who are in the forefront have to pay a price. I don't want to pay a price with my life, but I know that I have to pay a price uh, for speaking for, for, for democracy. So the environmental movement has become a political movement. The environmental movement has become part and parcel of the pro-democracy movement. What is the most important thing you see coming out of the Rio summit, and what concerns do you have about the United States' role at the conference? Well, I think especially this time when we only have one superpower, that is the United States of America. Everybody expects the United States to provide the leadership because it's the only power, the only big power left. And if it's going to provide leadership, this is one place because we are now concerned about the future of the planet. And the United States is the greatest consumer on this planet. It's also known to be the greatest polluter on this planet. What do you want to see the U.S. do that it hasn't done? Well, we want to see the United States committing itself to certain interactions, doing what is necessary to be done so that the uh, global warming is halted and is under control. We want to see a more just and equitable society in this world. But the United States is not committed enough. It is not supporting the reductions that are being proposed. It wants to continue the same business as usual. And this cannot be. And I'm quite sure that if the United States does not make it that kind of a commitment, it will be very difficult to have any conventions signed or respected. How will this be viewed in the underdeveloped world? Well, most developing countries will just conclude that America doesn't want to change her lifestyle and that she's not worried. Now, what concerns me uh, to a certain extent is America has all the scientists. It has all the data. Do we want to wait until the irreversible damage is done before we start doing something? Isn't this threat actually worse than the threat of communism? Because it is being projected by forces that we may not always be able to stop. And therefore, wouldn't we be prudent to stop them before it is too late? Give me an example of what you're talking about. Well, let us say the, the consumption patterns of the North, for example, especially in this country, people are although I must give them credit for being very aware now, you, you see a lot of awareness in America about uh, uh, living health lives and uh, recycling and uh, not dumping um, and not throwing toxic chemicals anyhow. You see a lot of consciousness as far as America is concerned. I am not sure that they are aware that when the dumping is not done here, it is done elsewhere, and quite often in the other developed countries of the South. What do you say to those who say that now that the Cold War is over, the underdeveloped and developing world is looking for another way to get money and support out of the Western industrialized nations, and that the environment now is a way of putting a guilt trip on those countries? Well, I would, I would uh, want to appeal to the politicians that this game must end, that we really, we are not concerned here about playing games. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, certainly for the African region, playing those games did not help Africa. Africa is worse off today than it was 30 years ago uh, before we got all that money. Uh, what is important is that there is a genuine partnership, a genuine uh, partnership to assist regions that are underdeveloped to develop, and genuine partnership to develop the resources that may be in the South for the benefit of both communities, and not, not to try to exploit, because there is also that, that fear that forever the South is uh, available for exploitation. But you've been very critical of the way in which some of the underdeveloped and developing nations have used aid from the 
Western industrialized nations. Let's take uh, our own uh, region again, Africa. We have seen a lot of uh, aid flowing into Africa, but a lot of that aid was in the form of uh, um, machinery uh, or arms, arms that was partly used to sustain dictators that we are now desperately trying to get rid of. And as you can see in my own country, it's very difficult. And this was done with the full knowledge and backup support of the superpowers. And, and yet, and, and, and the other thing is, a lot of those leaders, because we didn't have any power over them, because we could not question them, because they were dictators, they stole a lot of that aid and they stuck it away somewhere in the north for a rainy day, which is coming soon for some of them. Uh, and it was with the full knowledge again with those who gave aid. And we all know that it is the ordinary people, the ordinary men, women, and children in the countryside who continue to pay for this aid. And that's why we have been saying the debt burden is actually the burden acquired by the leaders but passed on to the ordinary people to pay. And so when you go into these regions, especially our region, you find poverty, untold poverty, despite all the aid. And all we are saying now is, for goodness sake, if you're going to go through uh, with this aid, it has to be aid that reaches the people. Of course, that is why we are saying that democracy is a just democratic governance is a prerequisite for proper development. And if we don't have that, we might as well not have any aid because it's only going to enrich a few individuals. Fortunately, if we can be allowed to complete this process, this democratization process, and put in some mechanisms that will check uh, our leaders, then we will be able to apply aid in the proper way and really work on poverty. Unless we can do that, we may agree in Rio that poverty is a big issue and should be addressed, but it will remain on paper. Are you optimistic? Oh, I'm very optimistic. What I'm most encouraged about is the fact that there will be a lot of women there and uh, grassroots people, because uh, the women especially uh, will bring in more energy and will bring a lot of inspiration and commitment that women have and which we need in this new age. Why do you think that women are so active in this movement? What is it about women and their relationship to the environment? I try to think why I myself personally get involved and, and, uh, and I think that it is because that most of us when we do what we do, we're thinking about our children. I think women have this capacity of projecting their own desires and hopes into their children. I see them having a, a very um, projected commitment, a, a, a common commitment that is able to bring them together and break all the bridges that usually keep men apart. Well, Dr. Wangari Matai, thank you. Thank you indeed.